So, Tim, do you remember that time when you and I had an interview with a famous author and the book didn't arrive at your house until the morning of the interview? Oh, man, I, I definitely remember that. I was totally panicked. I, I I don't think I've ever tracked a package so closely as I did that one. <laughs> like, what <laughs> block is it on? I basically, I, I had to consume like a 250-page book to prepare for an interview in with like an hour to spare. It was crazy. Well, and, and you can tell this from your perspective as well, but I've had similar situations with not reading the book as we approach the hour when we're going to interview the guest. Not because uh, that book didn't arrive, just because I'm lazy. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? Is that it? <laughs> yeah. Or, or I was too busy or whatever else it was. But yeah, there are those moments when you're like going, ah, crap, I have a lot to read. And I have a limited amount of time, which I need to be able to consume all of this in. Yeah. Okay, folks. So as part of our Abbey Road recording sessions, we... Wait, wait, wait. Do, do listeners know what we're talking about oh. when we talk about our Abbey Road recording sessions? I, I think they do by now. But just in case this sounds unfamiliar, Kurt and I booked a day at the famous... Abbey Road Studios in London with our good buddy from England back in October 2022. And because we had the whole day, we recorded a bunch of sessions. And most of these were recorded with Christian Hunt, who is our dear friend and host of the Human Risk Podcast. Which you should check out because Christian has guests who range from experts in compliance Ooh. and comedians. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and he does a fantastic job of getting to some very cool human behavior insights in every every episode. Yeah, in abundance, I would say. Yes. And yeah. so Christian and Kurt and I were at Abbey Road for the day. And this is one of those sessions. We did it because... We have all found ourselves in that position of trying to consume a ton of material in a very short period of time. So let's just start with the obvious. You already know that Behavioral Grooves is the podcast that explores our behavior through a scientific lens. And you already know that I'm Kurt Nelson. And you already know that I'm Tim Houlihan. And by the way, by now, you know that in this episode, we're going to take a deep dive into the shallow waters of what it's like to read a book when you only have an hour. <laughs> or, or two. Yeah. So, or two. so we're going to take a peek behind the curtain a bit and show you how we make the sausage, as they say. Nicely mixed metaphors there, Kurt. Um, OK, so more specifically, <laughs> we're going to look at how we make the sausage when we don't have all the ingredients ready to go. <laughs> oh, OK. OK. Yeah. Th th that's probably more like it. So we hope you never find yourself in a situation where you have to absorb a book in an hour or two. You know, that you like set aside the time up front and yes. you actually have the willpower to do that Plan. as opposed to watching that other episode <laughs> of, you know, Downton Abbey or whatever it is. <laughs> but um, but but if you, you find yourself in this situation, here's some tips from Christian and Tim and me on how to do it. And, and on top of some great tips, I think you're going to like hearing the banter with our fellow podcaster, Christian Hunt. So with that, we invite you to sit back with a very fat pour of a very thin, absorbing a book on the fly topic. <laughs> <laughs> and you enjoy our Abbey Road grooving session with Christian Hunt. So, Kurt, I'm curious. There have been times when we've been under, I, I, I know that we have been under some time pressure sometimes with, with guests, and it's been hard to have, you know, a week or two to read the book, and maybe you've only got a day, and yet we've got an interview, you know, tomorrow. What, do, what are you going to do? How do you deal with that? How do you absorb the most content that would be relevant in a short period of time? I outsource it to you. Oh. <laughs> Jim, you read the book. Great. All right. Thank you. What, what, do I, what, what are the cliff notes? What do I need to know? No. Um, you're, joking aside, there is, I think, some things that people can do, at least things that Tips, I do. techniques. Yeah. yeah. And so, and you've taught me many of these, right? Seriously? Yes. You've. You, how do you start to read a book? Where do you go for, where do you start? Uh, uh, index. Yeah. You start in the index. You start in that bibliography. The bibliography, kind of yeah. At, yeah. At where the different pieces are. And so, not, not that I do that on every book, but I know if it's a, if it's a big psychology kind of tome, I do that because it kind of gives me a, 
a lay of the land. Here are the here are the the big things that they they're at least referencing in here, and so right. I can kind of wrap my head around that. Then I look at the inde- or the table of contents. Table of contents thank yeah. you, and kind of see how things are are structured in there. Uh, and then if I really have a, a short period of time and I can't just sit down, because the way I would love to read it is to start reading. And to be there and taking notes in the margins of it's a paper book. If it's not, if it's a electronic, you know, making sure I highlight different sections and write notes as if I can in Readwise, which is the the tool that I use to collect my kind of collection of of those types of things. Uh, but then, and and just kind of have that time to absorb it, and then read, you know, a chapter or two at a time, and then just stop. Well, you this, gotta let that, it, that would be your ideal way. That would be my ideal. Yeah. If it's not, what I typically do is try to try to look for those pieces within because there's a lot of filler in many books, right? There's there's some of the some of the stories that are there to highlight things, and sometimes those stories are actually really important, but many times they're stories and they're used to highlight something as opposed to really get into the So how do you know what is the meat? If you're you open to a chapter three, how do you know what is the meat that you should be going after and where you think there's some expletive story? Uh, That's a good question. I think part of that is hopefully that I didn't just open it at chapter three, that I started in chapter one and chapter two. And those will tend to take more time. And I can see the writing style of the author. And within that writing style of the author, I can understand, do they preload the beginning of the of the chapter with stories that are going to be then used as metaphors and different pieces going in, and they're probably pretty important? Or do they preload them with stories because they're interesting stories, but the real guts is later? Or do they just start with, like, here's the meat and then tell a story afterwards? Or... You know, again, do the authors, many of them who start off will tell you what they're going to say and then kind of go through and doing it. And others will go through and they will summarize at the end of the chapter. And so you read that first chapter or two and you can start to get a sense of how that author is writing. So understanding that you go in in those types of stories. All right. Is this a story that I really need to to read? What I found interesting and then I I'll want to you know, turn this over to Christian and back to you as well, is that 80% of the books that we've gotten, and and then we're talking like, you know, more of the business-oriented, um, behavioral science-oriented books, the vast majority of the interesting information is in the first four to five chapters. And then there's four and five chapters that it's like, filler. ooh, what did you, you just had to get to the 200-page word count, didn't you? And there are there are exceptions to that. Plenty. And I will tell you, I mean, uh, the one Dan Pink's regret book, actually, it started off really slow and not really that interesting to me. And oh, my God, the last three chapters were like gold. It was like, Agreed. holy crap, this was this is amazing, which is contrary to how many of the books that we read do this. So I think there's a part of that. And so after a certain amount of time, you can start to go. What are the places I can I can skim? What are the places I need to read in in depthly? And then you know, hopefully, if you have time, again, for us as we're thinking about interviews, is going back over it right before the interview and being able to kind of go back in there and, and again refreshed. highlight some different pieces. So, Christian, yeah, so I have a slightly counterintuitive approach to it, and and I, I should disclose my my university degree was all about reading books. So I did literature degree, and so there was unsurprisingly as a student there are quite a few occasions where there may have been a lot of time available in theory but in practice it was kind of emergency reading so um <laughs> so I, I, i'm urban in right. his little yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, procrastinator's map if you've so, ever seen so, it <laughs> it's great so i have I've, I, I can speed read which is tremendously helpful so that's that's technique one but that's not a helpful bit of advice to dispense to other people but the other thing I'm I'm doing is I'm thinking about why am I trying to read this? Mm. And I'm not trying to read this to consume every last drop of it. What I'm trying to do is to get a sense of what it's about. And so one of the things I do is not actually, if I've got a limited amount of time, is, is maybe actually not read the book, but do a little bit of reading around it, right? So I will go onto the publishers. What is this book? Try, what, what's, how is this being sold? What's, what's, what's the purpose of this thing? What do they want me to get out of it? And then I might read interviews or, or watch videos or listen to other podcasts. You, you, not to be tried with our shows, obviously, but you can listen to shows at double speed and, and pick things up. 
And I'm trying to see other times when they've, when they've talked about the book, in part to see if there's something interesting that I want to riff off. Also to see what other questions they're asked, because I don't want to replicate the standard right. questions. And so I'm looking for a bit of context around that and thinking, well, how are they talking about the book and what, what might make an interesting discussion? And I focus my, then my reading is focused very much around the discussion I'm going to have. And I find sometimes I need to reread books that I've read for the show because I haven't read them in the way that I would read them if it was just a bit of, you know, either a bit of fun or if it was something that I was looking to I, really get to grips with. I find that all the time. Yeah. Right. And particularly the books that I go, that's kind of interesting, but I, I'm not reading it in the way that I would read it. If I was just consuming it, I'm reading it yes. for the purpose yeah. of the show. So to reread it in it's, a different mindset is absolutely something that I do. Fantastic. Yeah. And and I'm also, I'm fascinated. You know, one of the things I want to get out of people in the in the conversation, back to the stories, there's always stuff that's on the, I don't know what the book equivalent of the cutting room floor is, but, but you know, that, there's those things that didn't quite make it in that were taken out by the publisher. And so one of the things I'm trying to get to is to get those stories out of people. And ah. so thinking about, you know, if you listen to other interviews, you, hear that you, you can sort of get a sense of where, you know, maybe the chapter was going to be originally twice as long. And there was an extra bit they would have tackled. And so trying to get them into into that space. And so there's, it's it's partly, you know, it's partly sort of turning, uh, you know, making virtue out of necessity in the sense that if you don't have much time, you, you I could plow through it and try and get through it. But that's not a, that's, you know, that just feels like a, that's just a sort of a marathon effort and, and trying to, but, whereas if you can just find some things that are useful. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking around it and saying, I guess what I'm saying is I solve the problem by other means, mm -hmm. which is I don't try and read it. You actually don't try to get through the whole book or no, consume I'm, I'm, the I'm book. No, I'm looking for, and, and, you know, yeah. then, then, then I do your, and this is where I think having a, a, a digital version is quite helpful because you can then search for things. So if I know what subject, you know, I, here's something I've heard them say somewhere else or something I think is going to be of interest. So I guess it's the same trick as your, as your index point, Tim. It's like, here's a theme that might interest me. What words might they have used? Let's pull that, let's search that through and see what, what comes out. And then, and then that gives you the bits that you can dive into. But I think recognizing that if one were to spend the time trying to read it, you're either going to speed read it or you're going to, you know, you're not going to consume it in the way that, Tended. So I'm, I look at it very much as reading with a purpose. What, what about you? I like that. Uh, well, you heard my comment about starting with the index, and, and that only works with print. That, you know, uh, none of the digital versions that I can remember have indexes. And so it's really great. And so the index does a couple of things. As Kurt noted, the great benefit is saying, oh, well, who's reference? What, what, are the, what are the key topics that keep coming up? How, is, how deep is this particular topic? This one silly little measure I have is how many times is Danny Kahneman referenced? <laughs> you know, one time, six times, 20 times. Like, okay, this gives me a feel for what the book is about, actually, just by the Kahneman index. But what I do, <laughs> but what I do see is uh, I also get to see things that were things that I didn't expect. I see the unexpected and I go, oh, that's interesting. Mahatma Gandhi is listed in the is is in the index. What the hell is Mahatma Gandhi? Two sixty seven. Man, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna highlight. So my my first thing is to highlight the index, and then like Kurt, I go back to the to the overall organization of the book, and that happens with the with the uh, table of contents. I also like what's happening in a um, academic journal article is is there's an abstract. There's this wonderful tool just to get a feel for this is the author has worked very, very hard to write 16 or 20 or 40 pages explaining everything that they did. And then they've had to boil it down to a couple of paragraphs. And I really respect those authors for, for doing that work because that actually tends to give me a feel for this is what that, that paper really is about. This is the nugget that they want you to take away. It's their opportunity to sell me on the idea that I should invest all this time. But when I only have a, a very short amount of time, that abstract on, on an academic journal is a fantastic tool to use. So I, I will double down on the abstracts for uh, research papers and various different pieces from academic journals. And acad reading an academic journal article is different than reading a book, too. They're, they're usually, very rarely are popular press books written the same way that an academic journal is. And if they are, they, they're probably horrible because they're, they're just written <laughs> right. in a horrible Hypothesis way. Hypothesis one. Hypothesis yeah, two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But what I also find in academic journals is understanding that abstract, understanding what a, the findings are, because they'll usually outline those there. And then they, they talk usually about what the hypothesis is to a certain degree up there. And again, within those academic papers, it's like a dissertation. Dissertation is kind of usually the same format. Chapter one, 
is setting up the problem. You know, why is this important? Chapter two is the lit review. Chapter three gets into methodologies. Chapter four is the test and chapter five is your conclusion. And when I look at research papers, they follow that same format for most part, not every single one. And I'm always interested in why the problem is set up, right? Yes. And I'm why did they, why did they pretty, see this yeah, as the issue? What is, why, why are you here, right? What is this? And and chapter two, that lit review part of it, and it doesn't it, they don't fall into chapter one, two, three in the in the research articles, but that that literature review is also really interesting because it sets this like what's the historical context for this? What is the pieces that are leading up into this? And and what did this author think was relevant? Yeah, right. right. From from the history, because if we have this pantheon of of literature available, what did they curate to put together Which something that informed them? Really interesting, because if you look at it if, with just a reading it, that's great. But if you look at it with a critical eye, you go, oh. Why didn't they include, you know, Eggs. these yeah. types of things? Oh, this is going in this way. Oh, they didn't include this. Well, yeah. that's interesting. Why did, or, wow, they spent a lot of time focused on this one area. Yeah. Wow. Uh, then you get into the hypothesis and the, and the research methodologies, and I tend to scan over those, and I tend to scan over actually the results, particularly once it starts getting into mathematical things, unless I, I feel – I will always check to see how big the study is. I will check to see, you know, what are the p values? What are some of the different factors that are in there? And who if are the audience anything, members? Who, yeah, like who, yeah, like is was, it was students? It, was is it, it sixty college students? Yeah. yeah. And so, and I, I'll take a deeper look if I feel that there's anything else there. But that's not my forte. It's not where my strength lies. And so, I will often just like, all right, if it's been a prestigious journal, I'm hoping that the the kind of peer review process has weeded out anything that would be horrendously horrible about this. But I do appreciate those people that when they do give constructive criticism of those types of papers, when they get into that, oh, you use this methodology and looking at this and it was a binomial distribution as opposed to normal distribution, that doesn't really work. And you go, oh, I didn't think about that because my brain doesn't work that way. But I will then get into the conclusion, and where I spend most of my time is front and back in research yeah, papers. Yeah. So, yeah, it's uh, it's fascinating because part of me just thinks, you know, we're not academics and we're not scrutinizing things through an academic lens. What we're trying to do is to pr to promote ideas, and so I wouldn't go as far as saying, look, I'll have any anyone on the show with any any nonsense they've come up with. But sometimes it's it's actually just not necessarily the findings of the research, but it's even just the thinking that's gone into it, the thinking behind the hypothesis. Somebody's invested some time to think about this dynamic, and therefore my takeaway often from these things isn't necessarily that, you know, the, the, okay, the findings are really interesting. It's the whole idea. So, so let's let, what is it they've explored? How have they thought about exploring it? And so in, in, in many respects, I can, I can find, you know, particularly when I think about the audience, is, is you know, what we're trying to do is bridge a gap, I think, between – the academic papers that the average person isn't desperately interested in reading, because if they were, they'd be reading them. They'd be reading them, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and trying to how do we how do we translate that into something that that, that speaks human? I, I would I would disagree. I think that many people are actually interested in reading them, but they're written in such a way that nobody wants to read them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so they're inter they're interested okay. in what they're saying. They're not interested in reading the because it's academic speak. It's a lot right. of math. It's a lot of hypothesis one. It's going back in that lit review and looking at, you know, Johnson and Smith in 1973 found this and this, but that contradicted by, you know, Howard and Jones on 1979. And, you know, you just like you get lost, you get lost in academic papers relatively easy. They, they are not a book that you can just read, sit down and read. You have to, you have to. Focus. You have to study. You have to be really intentional about it. So I think there are a lot of people who would like to read, which is why I think many of the best-selling like behavioral science books are from researchers who've done a great amount of research. The the Kahnemans of the world, the Richard Thalers of the world, but then they have the ability to summarize all of those findings in a manner that is digestible for others. So, right. you know, and sometimes even that is hard. Thinking fast and slow is not an easy read. No, you know, no, but it's a good read. But it's a good read. Yeah. You know, Nudge is better because he had Cass with them, I think. And that is, you know, <laughs> Cass <laughs> writes, as, from what we understand, just like writes a, a, a paragraph every two minutes. Yeah. Right. 
um, and he writes them well. And so, and, you know, I think there are there are those things too, which is why really good. Like we just interviewed, you know, David Robson, who is a writer, and those writers that are able to do that, Dan Pink, you know, some of the other who are you know journalists or in background or writers in background that can consume the science, understand the science, and then turn that around and write it in a way that is understandable for people are the best books and the most impactful books. Yeah. Okay. Top two tips from each of you. Top two tips for what you would help. What what could help someone who is going to have to read the book in a very short period of time or consume the the academic journal in a very short period of time. Top two tips. Christian? Understand why you're reading it, because there's different ways of reading things. And the second thing is, and you have to be slightly careful with this, but other people may have done a nice bit of summary for you that can help focus you. So look for those as well. Skim that uh, the, the book to be kind of get a, a understanding of what it is, whether that be the bibliography and the index or the upfront, table of contents, table of contents yeah, or even just kind of you know, skimming through, kind of reading, understanding what are the main things. I will double down on understanding why that that's part of it. What you're trying to get out of it, I think, is very important to that. But then also understanding very as quickly as you can, try to understand how the author is writing and then what are the important parts, because every author is different. And so understand how this author is writing to know if I only have to, they do a you know, a one page summary at the end that kind of really outlines everything in there. If I only have a little bit of time, that's are fantastic. And then within that part, I can go back and maybe read a little bit more about that one piece that's really important to me, but understand the author and their writing. And if you can't do any of those things, just let your partner do all the reading and then you just tag along. And, <laughs> oh, yeah. What he said, I'll double down on that. I would say that when you're going through, if you're if you're going to use the read the index first or read the table of contents first, let your curiosity be your guide. So look for not only the themes that are common or sort of bundled up, but also go, oh, my gosh, I I didn't realize that uh, Julio Iglesias was important to this writer because there's there's three references to Julio. And so, you know, what's that about? And uh, if you're curious about Julio Iglesias, um, you know, whatever. And uh, and I think that the, the second thing, actually, I really appreciate what other people have done. I'm. Not a big fan of relying on the questions that publishers send us. Uh, I, I kind of disregard them, but I do appreciate what a publisher might write about how they think, you know, what they think the book is about, you know, and and I think that that's good to see if, whether it's in a, a TED talk or a, a critical article or or in in some kind of a summary. To, to that point, I've also been very surprised at some really good insights that you get from reading. Amazon reviews or Goodread reviews of that book. If if the book has been out, yeah, right, and you can read what other people say, and particularly like on Amazon or one of those where there's you know star ratings, and you can look at the five star ratings, but then you also look at the two star ratings. What didn't someone like? Yeah, right? and sometimes those are just fluff and create you know whatever, yeah. and you kind of realize. But there are some where you go, oh, that's an interesting perspective. And again, I like doing that sometimes after I've read the book, too, to see it, what I've missed, um, as opposed to kind of yeah. reading it before. That would then, you know, maybe prime me to look for certain things or, you know, bias me in any way. But we get by. That's the thing, is that we take these short periods of time, we package them up, we use these tools to make the most uh, out of both our experience with the book and to take the most out of it at the same time. Yes. Yes. 